Hi, my name is Karen Cordero. I'm an art historian, curator, and writer. I was born in the U.S., but I've lived and worked in Mexico for almost 40 years, most of them as a professor of art history at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City and at the UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. I also worked extensively in museums and exhibitions focusing primarily on 20th and 21st century Mexican art and on body, gender, and sexual identity in art. I'm delighted to participate in this series of lectures that anticipate the exhibition on Frida Kahlo at the Clive Carney Museum of Art and my talk, which is titled Frida Kahlo, Subjectivity and Self-Representation, will offer some elements for a reading of Kahlo's work in the light of contemporary feminist art, art history, and theory. I look forward to having a dialogue with you after the presentation. Okay, all set. So again, I'm delighted to be here with you today. And the, the, the title of my talk is Frida Kahlo, A Politics of Subjectivity and Self-Representation. So Frida Kahlo's work, little known and appreciated during her lifetime, acquired importance and preeminence in the light of second wave feminism, precisely because of its distinctive qualities that related to the feminist motto, the personal is political that underlies the revolutionary social, theoretical, and cultural contributions of that movement, providing keys to the mode of visualization of female corporeal experience and subjectivity that appears in the work of radical women artists of the 1960s and 70s in the US, Latin America, and Europe. As you can see here in this image, Kahlo's unibrow was incorporated as a symbol, as a symbol of women artists' rights and visibility by the collectives of women artists of the time. Nevertheless, Kahlo's work has most often been interpreted in terms of her biography, in ways that frequently downplay the relationship of her work to its social context and its political impact. Perhaps because its politics were very different from the types of political art that were foregrounded in the 1930s and 40s, during which she created the majority of her works. Moreover, the sensationalist commercialization of her work and her image, both in terms of what is marketed as its stereotypical Mexicanness, as well as through the simplified replication of some of the characteristics of her distinctive visage, one of the principal subjects of her complex and subtle self-portraits, could be interpreted as a perhaps unconscious evasion of its profoundly critical nature. In isolating Kahlo's production as unique, its potential for catalyzing a rereading and rewriting of the narrative of Mexican art history, and indeed art history in general, has been devalued. In favor of the persistence of the Vasarian model of individual genius that has been the cornerstone of patriarchal art history, combined with a conventional historiographical strategy of linking female artists, artists' success with their relationship to male colleagues that artist and writer Mira Shore has identified as patrilineage. This is not to say, of course, that there have not been sensitive and astute close readings of Kahlo's work from a feminist and contextualized perspective in the wide ranging and very extensive number of publications on this artist. There have, of course, but they often seem to be in an unequal battle in public space, particularly with more critical uses of art and art history. So this talk will try and highlight several ways of framing and unpacking Kahlo's production that suggest lines of interrogation and interpretation that illuminate the pertinence of her work to contemporary issues of subjectivity, performativity, and self-representation offering some paths toward a reading of the very soon upcoming exhibition in this respect. The body is the center of Kahlo's discourse, but in a way that marks a notable distinction from the heroic monumental representations of the Mexican body 
and other bodies as well, that are the hallmark of the murals and easel paintings of prominent male artists of her time, such as Rivera, Siqueiros, and Orozco. Not only are paintings set aside by their small anti-monumental size and a technique focusing on precise detail in a deliberately naive style that echoes 19th century provincial portraiture and popular votive painting. They also address the body from the standpoint of female experience in a fluid movement between its interior and exterior, creating novel strategies of representation that dislocate the tropes of painting in post-revolutionary Mexico and imagine new ones in order to express things that had no existing models in the visual art of the period. While they do draw, of course, in part on her intimate personal context, they also create a visual and conceptual language that like that of Virginia Woolf in literature, begins to imagine a distinct aesthetic that resonates intuitively with shared aspects of human experience that have been associated with what feminist thought and theory beginning in the 1970s conceptualized as feminine writing. Rereading Diego Rivera's 1943 essay, Frida Kahlo and Mexican Art, we can find allusions to this quality. Frida's art is individual collective. Consequently, she paints at the same time the exterior and interior of herself and the world. And moving on a little further in the text, he continues, a single life contains all these elements of all other lives. And in penetrating a life completely, one discovers abysmal depths, dizzying heights, and an infinite web of ramifications lasting through the centuries of light and the shadow of life. That's the end of the quotation. And Kahlo's close friend, the writer and journalist Anita Brenner, noted in a 1936 review of a New York exhibition of Georgia O'Keeffe's painting, in which she critiques its celebration by male art critics as an expression of the ineffable feminine. And she states, if there is such a thing as a peculiarly feminine painting, which is quite possible, it has been far more tellingly expressed by at least three other women artists that this writer can think of now. Agna Enters, Caroline, Caroline Dulieu, and Mrs. Frida Rivera, as Frida Kahlo was called at the time. And I continue the quote, all three of these women have the touch of malice that makes sisters under the skin. All three have wit. All are very conscious indeed of the physical nature of the world and none have even the ghost of mysticism. Art historian Dina Komisarenko in a recent essay on the musician, writer and activist Concha Michel and her relationship with Kahlo and with the writer and painter Aurora Reyes also suggests that the three women were linked by a feminist vision of the time that argued for distinct power relations and social values founded on women's experience, a perspective that Komisarenko associates with what is understood today as feminism of difference. These references to the otherness of Kahlo's work in terms of alternative views of gender relations that circulated among the group of artists and intellectuals, particularly women artists and intellectuals with whom she associated during her lifetime, can be more clearly conceived in theoretical terms in the light of the proposals of the French feminist author, Hélène Sissou, who writes in the 1970s in The Laugh of the Medusa. By writing herself, women will return to the body, which has been more than confiscated from her which has been turned into the uncanny stranger on display, the ailing or dead figure, which so often turns out to be the nasty companion, the cause and location of inhibitions. Censor the body and you censor breath and speech at the same time. Write yourself, your body must be heard. 
Only then will the immense resources of the unconscious spring forth. In the same respect, Kahlo's paintings and drawings create an alternative language that springs from her corporeal, corporeal experience, drawing on and at the same time reconceiving elements of the visual culture of her time in order to articulate terrains that move fluidly between what is traditionally understood as objective and subjective, and between multisensorial perception and affect. Like much of feminist art and literature of the 1970s and after, but with a head start of 40 years, she addresses issues that emerged as key aspects of a rereading of culture that had been invisibilized in existing patriarchal discourse. Paulo, like a number of today's feminist artists, uses her own body not as a narcissistic vehicle, but as a vantage point for the exploration of aspects of experience that did not have pictorial references in her own time. It is a site of interior and exterior perception and affect that through her conceptual and formal decisions, constructs a symbolic language that addresses territories of common human experience that only later in the 20th century became more commonly articulated in art, literature, and philosophy. Kahlo's 1945 painting, The Mask, which is one of the pieces that will be in the exhibition that's opening in a week or so, two weeks, offers us significant clues to the nature of the self-portraits and portraits that form a major part of her artistic production. Expressing her awareness of portraiture as a vehicle of construction of social identity and of dress, an aspect attentively represented in her portraits and self-portraits as an element that transmits a social codification of individuals and particularly women. In the mask, in a telling gesture, and here I contrast it with this other self-portrait, which will also be in the exhibition, Kahlo covers her self-portrait with a somewhat grotesque carnival disguise, as if to say, enough, announcing her satiety with a repeated simulacrum of fixity, fixed identity, where ambiguity and multiplicity in fact reign, and suggesting that the expressive non-mimetic face of the mask is perhaps the most authentic representation of her inner state as opposed to, to the self-portraits. This pictorial gesture resonates with the work of contemporary Mexican artist, Monica Castillo, who in self-portrait in sections and self-portrait as anyone, part of an extensive series of self-portraits in the 1990s, also probes the impossibility of a single fixed identity. And the mask also echoes with the powerful piece, You Are Not Yourself, created by the US feminist artist, Barbara Kruger in 1981. Here, a shattered mirror intervened with letters suggesting those used in advertising, proclaims the need for other strategies of representation and self-representation in accordance with women's experience. In a series of important works of the 1930s, including the paintings Henry Ford Hospital and My Birth in 1932 and The Miscarriage in 1936, Kahlo develops a distinctive symbolic strategy to refer to women's corporeal experience and its effective implications. The emotional state referred to in these works can be pertinently characteristic as abject, a term used by the philosopher Julia Kristeva to refer to a breakdown in the distinction between self and other, which can be understood in Jill Bennett's terms as a response to trauma, which belies conventional logics of, rep of representation. The British art historian, David Lomas, has argued eloquently that in Henry Ford Hospital and the Miscarriage, Kahlo recurs to medical imagery because the artistic canon of her time offered no resources to express her experience of miscarriage and its emotional implications, since the social mores of the time required these events to remain private and concealed. 
resisting their articulation in language and images. Kahlo may well have had in mind figures like those on the right hand of the screen that in contrast to the idealized classical model of the female figure created by John Gibson, which we see on the left, open up and allow for the dissection of the female body. She may also have been thinking of these of illustrations like these, not necessarily these particular ones that are in her library, several books of medical illustrations. These illustrations that isolate and cross-section the body's organs in order to describe their internal structure. These models allowed Kahlo to reimagine her body and express her sent, sense of fragmentation, alienation, and estrangement in the hospital environment. Through the extraction and conversion into symbols of elements that refer to aborted fertility, but also to the creative processing of its impact. For example, in the miscarriage, the left side of the image evokes the fetus and the disintegration of the elements that form new life, while on the right, an enlarged inverted teardrop turns into a painting palette held by a third arm that emerges from Kahlo's shoulder, while the blood combines with soil to generate a new cycle of nature. In Henry Ford Hospital and in My Birth, Kahlo draws on the conceptual spatial construction of votive painting to create a dreamlike environment in which hybrid symbols occupy the space where language fails. And this fact is potently confirmed by the lack of the ex expected inscription in the lower register of my birth here. While in its central axis, death and birth are combined and conflated as are diverse re religious symbols. Both the Mata Dolorosa on the image on the wall and a birthing pose characteristic of the pre-Hispanic goddess Tlazotel. In contrast to the stereotypical representations of the female body and its physical and symbolic identity and visual culture shown here, a number of strategies explored by feminist art in the US and Mexico in the second half of the 20th century established a dialogue with Kahlo's representations of female subjectivity based on a conception of woman's body from her body. Just to show a few of them, Alice Neal's self-portrait from 1980 and pregnant Margaret Evans from 1978 deliberately counter artistic conventions of representation of the female body by highlighting the experience of an aging body and a pregnant body in a way that acknowledges what it feels like to live in those bodies. In Carolee Schneeman's 1975 performance, Interior Scroll, she drew a narrow sheet of paper out from her vagina, reading from it a dialogue that set intuition and bodily processes against traditional patriarchal notions of order and rationality. Mexican artist Carmen Mariscal's photograph and light box, shown here, highlight a sense of fragility and corporeal duplication in pregnancy. Another Mexican artist, Paula Santiago's delicate sculptures made of rice paper, hair, and blood recreate a simultaneous interior-exterior evocation of the body in a way that closely echoes Kahlo's vision in the miscarriage in Henry Ford Hospital. And still another Mexican artist, Yolanda Paulson, in Emerging, uses a cast of a pregnant woman's body and integrates it with moist soil from which plants begin to sprout, offering yet another conception of fertility as experience rather than archetype. Thus, in this section of my talk, I hope to have shown how Kahlo's imagery, here in another example that will also be included in the upcoming exhibition, goes well beyond an anecdotal frame of reference constitute a distinct conceptual positioning in relation to the body and subjectivity. Now, Kahlo is not alone among the women artists of her generation in the creation of spatial configurations 
that embody various levels of female experience. Her contemporary, Maria Izquierdo, in works such as Portrait of Belém, seen here, evokes a space in which the young girl barely fits into the picture, awkwardly resting her arms on an oversized wardrobe that seems to crowd her out of the image, pushing her up against its border. In contrast with the carefully distributed, I thought perhaps socially distanced in our, in our current terms, objects on top of it. Another contemporary Colombian artist, Deborah Arango in Adolescence, evokes the heightened corporeal sensibility and libido of that phase, both through a reverberating, almost interuterine space that surrounds and envelops the figure and her inverted pose that at once suggests the position of a fetus about to be born and that of a mother in childbirth. Both of these artists, Arango and Izquierdo, suffered censorship during the first half of the 20th century as a result of their woman-centered iconography and formal invention. And we're just seeing here uh, an example of a mural project that Maria Izquierdo was hired to do and then was canceled because other major muralists such as Rivera and Siqueiros didn't think that she as a woman artist was capable of, of taking on work of that size and prominence. Paolo's work also explicitly denounced gender-based violence in works such as Unos Cuantos Piquetitos of 1935. This work is often reduced in interpretations to a metaphorical or perhaps allegorical, uh, more correctly, expression of, her, of Kahlo's pain as a result of Rivera's infidelity with her sister, Christina. But the work in fact has a broader social context in, the, in relation to the persistent issue of feminicide. It was inspired by a news story about a man who had murdered his fiance and at the trial characterist, characterized the 20 stab wounds he had inflicted on her as a few small nips, unos cuantos piquetitos. Kahlo's ironic reproduction of his words as a title on the apparently innocuous ribbon crowning the bloody scene recalls this sculpture by US artist Sue Williams titled Irresistible, 1992, in which the trampled body of a victim of domestic violence is inscribed with phrases that aggressors and their accomplices often use to justify their acts, such as, look what you made me do. And now in the final section of, of this talk, I'd like to complement this discussion of Kahlo's creative process with a close reading of the volume that has come to be known as her diary. Feminist art and theory joins and indeed takes on a pioneering role in relation to other currents of contemporary art in focusing on process as, as of equal significance to the product. And Kahlo's diary, more accurately characterized, I think, as an artist's notebook, suggest ways in which her creative process moved between various levels of experience, intertwining personal and political events with broader creative and philosophical reflections. The book, I think I should have jumped ahead a little bit here, carefully guarded in a vitrine in the museum in Kahlo's Blue House has been available for consultation in facsimile form since 1995 in this edition here. And in 19, sorry, in 2017, came out in a new version with an accompanying pedagogical workbook, more focused precisely on, on looking at the relation of her work to creativity. Several works in the upcoming exhibition in the Clive, Car Clive Carney Museum share the unfinished quality and lack of a canonical artistic format that is present in the diary which is a valuable source of information on Kahlo's creative process and from a contemporary standpoint can also be understood and interpreted as a work of art in itself. A kind of performative result of an everyday exercise in self-representation somewhat akin to the work by contemporary artist Janine Antoni seen here. 
The diary was created towards the end of Kahlo's life. And the image I, I'll be showing here are all images from the diary. In it, we encounter on the one hand elements that converse with some of her most celebrated works. And on the other, we can, we can experiment in which we can experiment a poetic and playful side of her creative being that allows a free suggestive engagement with her subjectivity and a fluid use of what I will call writing drawing. And in some cases also collage. We can understand the different gestures that were undertaken in the production of this volume through our own physical intuition and associate them with the feelings and the state of mind they entail. From the carefully and harmoniously calibrated letters, such as those we see here, to the less controlled calligraphy that sometimes becomes cryptic. From the pages on which drawings and faces with comforting curvaceous shapes prevail, as in the sketch here on the right, that echoes Kahlo's painting, Heaven, the Earth, Me, and Diego, to the faces that are decomposed in angular fragments with a certain Picasso-esque tone, as in these facing pages, where on the left we read, don't come crying to me, and on the right, the other vase answers, yes, I come crying to you. This is not a diary to be only read, it is one to be lived and experienced, involving all our senses as they interact in dialectical and dialogical forms while we navigate its pages. Even in the instances where Kahlo represents her body, apparently from the outside in the context of the diary, as in the nude portrait we can see on the left, the nude self-portrait with her amputated leg drawn in pencil on one of the last pages of the volume, she does so in a distinctive manner that emphasizes her vulnerability, creating an image that refuses to adapt to the aesthetic idealizations of her time and the economies of affect and gender that they administer. It is not surprising then to note that we do not find a similar treatment of the body in Mexican art until the 1980s with the postmodern questioning of hegemonic constructions of national identity and their corporeal references that coincide with both the emergence of contemporary feminism and with gay activism in the context of the AIDS epidemic. For example, on the left here in, in Magali Lara's Frida series of 1979, and on the right, portrait of Ruben Bautista by Ruben Ortiz from around 1989. This moment coincides as well, as I've mentioned before, with the period in which the work of Frida Kahlo experienced a dramatic increase in interest and valorization on a national and international level. A view of perception as a process that integrates the whole body, articulating connections between the senses, their expressive manifestations and their context, in some ways close also to the ideas of artists such as Kandinsky and Clay, is present in Kahlo's diary from the very start. In its play with the free association of words and concepts that leads up to what could be understood as a phenomenological manifesto. And here, well, the, the, the translation to English is not, not exact um, in the sense that the um, the subject is not defined in Kahlo's text as male or female, but in the translation, it, it, it's translated as he doesn't seem to see the color. He has the color. I make the shape. He doesn't look at it. He doesn't give the life he has. He has life. Warm and white is his voice. Likewise, from the start of the diary, Kahlo's use of a veritable symphony of colors in its pages makes its, its encounter a pleasurable experience of sensory stimulation that involves a process of integral physical perception. The connection and the dialogue between sight, touch, and sound activates our approach to the diary from the multisensorial perspective 
surpassing what we understand conventionally as reading to lead us to a fuller experience that opens up broader possibilities in the artistic act, as well as in its aesthetic reception. For example, instead of concealing her crossings out and changes in wording in the notebook to give the text an appearance of objectivity and distillation of truth, Kahlo highlights them. I'm talking about the section over here on the, on the left-hand side of the screen. She imposes the cold, strong hue of cobalt blue and the insistent upward downward movement of her pen, which creates a dense fence of ink over the rounded flow of her handwriting in a warm sienna hue. Despite her apparent energetic insistence in covering what is written, the letters seep through, inviting a double reading of the palimpsestic manuscript with its multi-directional flow of thought and its contradictions and reconsiderations. The use of words in Kahlo's diary appeals simultaneously to sight and hearing, and would also suggest perhaps touch and taste in images, particularly like the one on the, on the right, as does the handling of a considerable, a considerable palette of colors that she deploys. In the very, oops, something happened here in my text. Um, the varied hues of ink and the orchestration of the application of areas of pigment on each page, often independently from naturalistic representation. The diverse levels of saturation and gestural qualities that, as I mentioned above, sometimes seep through the page to appear on its backside, impregnate the diary with a textural and emotional intensity that is transmitted through its visual and material structure. Here, for example, we can just see all this, all this complexity in this, this part that has to do with how to make a, a tempera paint and another part which has to do with a more personal um, confession or uh, emotional register. The letters in various colors, sizes, and styles, the accidental ink stains, the superimposition of figures and faces, the areas of fluid color and scribbles that seem to respond to an instinctive associative logic, participate equally in the concert of possible meanings that this volume unleashes. The references range from the historical, the natural, the everyday, and the mythological, including pre-Hispanic culture, communist politics, and intimate memories and dreams. But they, but they always return once again to Kahlo's own body. Its representation, the question of its transformation, evolution and mutilation, and her consciousness of the passing of other bodies from Stalin's to that of Kahlo's friend, Isabel Chabela Villaseñor. Take for instance, this spread where on the left side, we see a red circle accompanied by the names of Engels, Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, and the communist symbol of the crossed hammer and sickle in a layout that recalls constructivist posters. And on the right, we find a striking existential scene that translates Kahlo's vital concerns in symbolic form, opening up multiple interpretative possibilities with watery areas of color, quick instructs, and some interventions in pencil, Kahlo here presents a landscape with a pyramid in the distance, and below it, uh, and it's located below the sun and the moon. The former is denoted simply by a red circle with the word sun, sol, inscribed on it, and the latter only by the word moon in black ink. The figure of the sun establishes a visual dialogue with the communist symbol on the previous page, while the symbolism of the two cosmic elements combined also refers to traditional representations of the crucifixion, and here perhaps alludes to eternity. An interesting um, reference in relation to the title of the exhibition, Frida Kahlo, Timeless. In the center of the right-hand page, 
The artist represents herself. She is identifiable through her Tawana dress with her back towards us, gesturing towards the pyramid with her right hand. And below, also in black ink, we see the word yo, me, followed by a scribble that suggests a question mark without the dot, thus putting into doubt the same existential questioning that it enunciates. A few pages later, the word yo appears again, transformed into ya already, and accompanied by the words, everything upside down, sun, moon, feet, and freedom. In this way, the combination of images and words, and sometimes the deliberate confluence between pictorial elements and letters in Kahlo's diary, traces a path that in contemporary art has been taken up by artists like Sai Twombly, or in Mexico, Magali Lara, among others. Thus, in closing, the diary of Frida Kahlo, although it was not considered an artistic object in its time, today can be understood as a visionary object that condenses alternative perspectives that were not part of the hegemonic narrative of post-revolutionary Mexican art. Like Kahlo's body of work in painting and drawing discussed earlier, it exemplifies a process-based integral, integral concept of art that crosses over disciplinary and temporal boundaries to suggest new forms of aesthetic dialogue with subjectivity and the everyday that continue to be very pertinent and suggestive in the context of contemporary art, political and social issues, and artistic pedagogy. So I hope you'll find these reflections useful when the exhibit opens and you're able to experience Kala's production directly through your own bodies. <laughs>